going on guys, it's Simo. So today I'm bringing to you my top five competitive budget decks for the May 2020 format. We're in a bit of an odd situation right now, right? I mean, if you look at the format, it's basically a two deck format being absolutely dominated and overwhelmed by Eldritch and Ad Emancipator. So being a budget player right now is kind of a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because the format isn't exactly kind to budget players, but it's a blessing because there aren't really any in-person events to be attending. All the events are online, so we don't really have to play in person. And you also don't have to worry about budget that much when you can just play online and everything is easily accessible for free. So take advantage of that while you can. You can actually play some of these top tier strategies at zero cost to you. And so that's a great way to not only hone your skills, but to take advantage of some card you might not be able to afford in person. But today I'm going to be covering five decks that you can pick up for about 100 to 150 dollars US, both main and extra deck, sometimes side deck, depending on the circumstances too. So that way, if you are looking to invest in a deck, maybe once we do start getting events again, that these decks are not only very cheap, but very competitive in the current format. And if you are looking to test your skills right now, we have the Pro Play Tour Weekend Championship taking place this weekend and every weekend during quarantine that you can compete in. 20 bucks to enter some huge cash prizing on the line every single weekend. There's no reason you shouldn't be competing. So click the link down below and sign up for this weekend's championship. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. So kicking things off with number five, I have a bit of a meme deck, I'm not gonna lie, but there is actually some validity to it. And looking at all the other decks we're gonna be talking about, I feel like those are probably the best chance you're gonna have. And the fifth one is good, but only to a degree. And that is the new Jeff Leonard special, Barrier Stun. Yes, Barrier Stun is back. Now, again, I know you're thinking it's Barrier Stun, there isn't a lot of validity to it, but if you think about it, if you get to be very lucky with your die rolls and you go first a lot, if you drop a barrier statue and have any way to protect it, albeit a equip spell or just some sort of card in your back row that can just make sure that, that statue stays alive, then against that Emancipator, they have zero outs game one and games two and three, their side deck options are gonna be very limited in terms of what they're gonna be able to do. Then if you go second, you can just go ahead and go to your side deck, side deck in a ton of hand traps to hopefully slow them down. Then that way, if you do, you can establish your own barrier statue you and be able to hopefully take the game from there. It's a bit gimmicky, but it does work in a lot of instances. Jeff has been competing in some of the Pro Play Tour tournaments and actually been seeing a reasonable amount of success with it, considering it is Barrier Statue. This deck is by no means refined and there's still a lot of room for improvement, but there is the potential that this deck can do rather well. Now, when you look at Eldritch, obviously it's a different story. Golden Lord is an out to Barrier Statues because you can just send it to the graveyard to send the statue to the field, but there are certain cards you can play to make sure that that does doesn't happen. And again, because a lot of these Eldritch decks are focusing on the combo half of the deck rather than the control, then that means you can capitalize on the barrier statue, denying any special summoning capabilities and be able to take games left and right. Again, it's a bit die rolling because you have to go first a lot of the time, but there are some instances like in Jeff Leonard's case that he is able to capitalize. And so I thought for fun, I would give barrier stun my number five slot. Now, somewhat gimmicky decks aside, let's move on to number four. Now, when constructing a deck in this format, you want to play a deck that can play a huge amount of hand traps to slow down both Ad Emancipator and Eldritch so that they aren't able to resolve their combos, and that way you are able to start taking control of the game once play passes around to you. So what's one deck that can play a absolute slew of hand traps, if not Sky Striker, yeah. Now this is a weird one, again, Engage is banned, right? So you might be thinking, how is Sky Striker even viable? Well, there have been some players such as Ryan Yu who have been piling Sky Striker at some of these Pro Play Tour events, I believe some of the luxury gaming events as well, and seeing a moderate amount of success. There hasn't really been a Sky Striker that's been able to crack into the top cut of any of these tournaments, but they've been at the top tables and maybe just gotten all the way to the bubble and bubbled out right before making top cut. So there is some validity to this strategy. One thing that Sky Striker has going for it is that it plays not only a ton of hand traps, but also a ton of spell cards as well. And when you're looking at some of these boards, some of these un seemingly unbeatable boards play a lot of monster effect negation, but not a lot of spell and trap negation. So what you're able to do is by using all of your good spell cards that Sky Striker has, Kagari's at three, remember that. So you get to get multiple uses out of some of these cards. You are then able to possibly control the 
game to the point with your Sky Striker cards. And when you look at a list here, like I'm going to put on screen, this is by no means a budget list because there are Lightning Storms and Evenly matches in here, but you can swap those out for hand traps of your choice, such as Nibiru the Primal Being, even Gamma, like that might be a good idea. If you swap those out, this deck is entirely budget and affordable for anyone. And again, these decks have been seeing success already. So for a budget player, that's what you want to see. You want to see those types of results. And I definitely think that Sky Striker can not only give you those results, but it's also not a terrible investment if for some reason Engage were to ever come off the ban list, which I don't think will be happening anytime soon. But nonetheless, it's still a pretty decent deck for what it's worth, even though Engage is banned. And so for those reasons, that's why I gave Sky Striker my number four slot. Now coming in at number three, we have yet another deck that can play a lot of hand traps and has a very self-contained engine, very similar to Sky Striker, and that is Zodiac. Now the reason why Zodiac is ahead of Sky Striker is that Zodiac has been able to pierce that top 16 bubble in not just one tournament, but multiple throughout several tournaments from this past format. Zodiac, now that Dryden is legal again, has a lot of good things going for it. Again, it can play a lot of hand traps, which is what you need right now if you want to slow these combo decks down to play your game. But most notably, the deck also has a win condition in itself, just outside of the Zodiac cards trying to control the tempo of the game, and that is Infinitrack Megaclops. If you are able to establish a Megaclops either turn one or maybe even turns two or three, then that might be your ultimate win condition because it's unaffected by all other monster effects. And when you look at a deck like, let's say, Adamancipator, it's going to be very difficult for them to deal with something like this because their deck is comprised almost entirely of monsters and Eldritch kind of falls in that same category and you can maybe go toe to toe with some of the top tier contenders of this current format. I just love seeing a deck like this see so much success. It did make top 16 in my Crush Card Cup, so if you guys haven't already checked that out, I have feature matches so you can see the deck in action, but man, it's really cool to see Zodiac back at it and it's so affordable. This deck is so cheap because the cards are really just not that hard to get right now. People aren't really looking at the deck for anything, so it's a nice investment to pick up if you have the availability to do so. And so for those reasons, that's why I gave Zodiac my number three spot. But coming in at number two, we have one of the top decks of the format that actually is a very decent competitive budget alternative, and that is Dinosaur. Now, you might be thinking Dinosaur and think, oh, I can't afford Animador and Archosaur. Those are like 50 bucks a copy. Or Pot of Extravagance, that's another expensive card. Well, bear in mind, Pot of Extravagance, first off, is getting reprinted next month at the time of recording this video, so that might bring the price of that card down significantly. However, maybe Animador and Archosaur might be out of your price range, but that doesn't mean Dinosaur isn't a deck that you can play at a budget competitive level. One thing that makes Dinosaur very appealing from a budget perspective is that Ultimate Conductor Tyranno is one of the few cards when paired with stuff like Dark Ruler No More, for instance, that can actually break some of these Ad Emancipator or Eldritch boards because it's just that beast of a boss monster. And that's what you want to look for when it comes to a deck that you want to play on a budget. Now, the thing is, the chasm between Ad Emancipator and Eldritch and all the other decks is very vast, but that doesn't mean there are some interesting interactions that Dinosaur has, like the aforementioned interaction. Now, the thing you also have to consider when it comes to this deck is that it can go first just as well, it can go second if you win or lose that die roll. You have to consider that with the True Kings, you can make stuff like True King of All Calamities going first, and that's a win condition in and of itself. That card is just brutal and so oppressive, and yeah, if you don't have Animador and Archosaur, it might be a little bit more difficult for you to summon that consistently, but even if you end on something like Ultimate Conductor Tyranno Dolka, that's still not bad. There are also cards you can incorporate in the side deck for a very cheap price that let's say you win game one and then you're going game two or maybe even game three and you want to be going first, you can throw in stuff like Summon Limit. You can throw in these just blowout cards that your opponent may not have an answer to and just win the game that way. Dinosaur is already one of the top decks before you consider the budget option. So why would we not take what's good about Dinosaur, cut out what's expensive and find a way to be able to play it and take advantage of the best cards that we can to do the most unfair things to stop our opponent from winning. I think that's the best way to look at it. And so for all those reasons, that's why I've got Dinosaur as my number two slot. But that's going to bring us to my number one competitive budget deck of the May 2020 format. And if you haven't already figured it out, we have another top deck of the format being Salomon Great. Now, again, like I said before, Salomon Great compared to stuff like Adam Emancipator and Eldritch, they're in completely separate leagues. But Salomon Great does meet our criteria of a deck that can play 
lot of hand traps, the engine is very self-contained, and you have some flexible space to be able to design the deck to compete against the current meta. That's why you see Salamagrate still being able to compete like two plus years later since its initial release because of that flexibility and adaptability when it comes to any particular format. So we already know you can play a ton of hand traps. That's one of the big advantages of Salomon Grape. But the reason I feel like Salomon Grape just barely edges out Dinosaur, at least from a budget perspective, is that you really don't have to restrict yourself in what you're playing. You can pretty much afford the entire Salomon Grape made in extra deck in the price point that we mentioned. And it's like versus Dinosaur where you kind of have to leave out some very important cards. Salomon Grape, you don't have to. A majority of the cards came from the Soul Burner structure deck, so they are all very cheap. Sign Up Mining has been reprinted now, so that card is cheaper than it's ever been, and that's the deck's main searcher. Yeah, the hand traps are a little bit pricey, but none of them are too ridiculous that you can't afford them. So the entire deck is very budget friendly, and it's a deck that not only can actually compete and go toe to toe with some of the top decks of the format, but if you go up against any of the other decks, especially in like the tier two rogue or beyond category, Salomon Grape can just decimate them with ease because it has built-in negations, it has built-in destructions, it kind of just has tools for every single situation, and as a result of that, that's what you want in a deck. Again, it's not going to be a nazy battle going up against Eldritch or Ad Emancipator. If you don't draw those hand traps, it's going to be difficult, but the thing is, any deck at this point is going to be facing similar struggles, and so if you want to invest in a deck, if there's a deck that, if, at the very least, if some of these decks get hit on the most upcoming ban list, Salomon Great's probably the most likely to survive moving forward. So if that is the case, and if Ad Emancipator and Eldritch do get absolutely crucified moving forward, Salomon Great's going to be in a good position to move up and actually be one of the strongest decks of the format going ahead, just depending on how things play out, because you pretty much have all the tools that you need. People are still even finding ways to innovate the deck with combinations like Topologic Zero Boros and Update Jammer for an OTK, incorporating Pot of Desires, so you can get your card draw in addition to that. But you can even go old school with Transcode Talker and Update Jammer as well. You've got Heat Leo for back row removal. The deck is insanely recursive, one of the most recursive decks in the game. What more could you ask for? And I think for all those reasons that I just mentioned, if there's going to be one deck to pick up from this list, I definitely think Solomon Great is my number one choice. But guys, those are just my thoughts. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think about your top budget picks for the May 2020 format. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And if you found this video helpful, consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member. Just by showing your support in any way that you can, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. So thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time.